Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Working with Imported FE Components in Master webinar. I'm Anthony Phoenix. Uh, I'm a Transmission Engineer at SMT. And today we're going to be going through uh, FE Components in Master, how we set them up within Master, condensation, and how the imp using Imported FE will affect your results and your analysis. So a quick note today. We're not going to be looking at the setup of your FE components in an FE package uh, prior to master because we support multiple packages and we don't have the facility to show exactly how you do that for all of those packages. Uh, if you do need further information on that, it is covered in our help manual and we may be able to give some assistance from our support team. So we're going to be looking at importing some FE into this transfer case model, which is one of our examples in our examples menu. First thing we're going to do today is we're going to jump straight into the FE tab. So almost everything we're going to look at is going to be in the FE tab, uh, looking at importing the components of your FE into master and the reduction in settings. And then we'll jump quickly into a few results from system deflection and MBH mode which hopefully most of you should be familiar with by now. So if we jump into imported FE tab. Uh, this is a model here with all of the FE already imported. So just to give you a quick look around at the system. On the left, we have the tree for the components. So you can see here we have each imported FE component. We have a planet carrier, an idler wheel, and the transfer case. And we can have several variations of FE within that model. This allows us to look at different FE options uh, within our design and perform analysis on varying design features. We have on the right, as we have with most versions of master, a main window, which includes everything that we can change within the FE tab and also a status window. Just to run quickly through the windows here so that we can uh, be familiar with them. This window on the left uh, in the model setup tab, this is where we can see a 3D representation of our model. In this case, because we have the full mesh planet carrier selected, this shows us the options for connections and varying options for this piece of FE. We can run quickly through the buttons we have at the top here. So the draw style predominantly changes what we can see in this 3D mode. The first button is relating to the nodes. So we can see here currently we don't have any nodes visible. We have an outline of the 3D component itself. If I were to change this, we could look at the surface nodes or all of the nodes within that FE component. Next, we have a similar option for this, but for the mesh. Obviously, that's fairly self-explanatory. If you want to view the mesh, this button allows you to do so. Following on from that, we have the surface option. So you can set whether the surface is either invisible, transparent, or completely solid. So we can see here a solid surface in this component. This is a full FE component, uh, is shown as a 3D item. When we change this to transparent, the slider on the right here with opacity allows us to, to view that. The next option we have here is rigid elements. Uh, this shows any connections between components within our model. There's only one component in here, so no connections will be shown. But if I were to look at the full casing, for example, we could see here Turn this off. These red lines here are where bonded regions are in between components in your model. The next few options here relate to the condensation nodes uh, within master. So the first one asks if you want to draw the nodes that are connected to the condensation nodes. So currently we're selected to all. These are the blue nodes we see displayed here. If you didn't want to see those, we can select none. Or with selected, you'll only see the nodes for the selected component that the condensation node relates to. 
by default, this is set to all. Next, we have the connections. It's very much uh, in a similar manner. We have by default set to none, but this shows the spiders between the condensation node and the nodes on the FE mesh itself. And finally, of these three options, we have the search regions. So by default, this is on selected. So when we choose a component, the search region can be seen, but this can be set to all. I believe this is only uh, counts for condensation nodes that are created in master. In this case, the condensation nodes uh, may have been created in the FE program, so the search regions aren't shown. We also have this grounded nodes option. Uh, this will show any grounded constraints within your model. Obviously, this is a rotating shaft, so we don't have any grounded elements here. But on the housing, for example, we should see this face being grounded. So this would be the contact with the transmission in this transfer case. Next, we have uh, this button here for highlighting bad elements. So selecting this will highlight any elements in your generated mesh, obviously for full FE only, with a negative Jacobian value. So there is a warning relating at the bottom here. So there are 179 elements with a negative Jacobian. Dependent on your level of analysis and internal pro uh, procedures, this may or may not be acceptable. Uh, but this button just allows you to see where they are in your mesh. This option here uh, to draw FE model from reduction. This, in this case, doesn't make any difference, but this will show uh, toggle on and off nodes that have been created uh, from reduction in master. Finally, on this list, we have the 3D axis. This will just turn the 3D axis for the component on and off. Quickly, we have the component draw style buttons. Uh, the far left shows a full transparent model, again, which is affected by the opacity slider. The next button shows solid components throughout the system, followed by solid shafts. And finally, the button that is on by default is connectable components. So this button will only show components if you have a shaft that has been replaced by FE in master. We can see over here on this 2D view, which we'll get to in just a second, there is a, a pink shaft. This is a replaced shaft in master. So every component in the model that's connected to this shaft will then be viewable with this button enabled. Finally, we have the node selection tab. This tab is uh, very useful for creating things such as accelerometers or accelerometer positions in master. So before your condensation, you can enable the node selection with this uh, crosshair button. The button to the right changes whether you're uh, adding or subtracting from the selection. So when you have the plus symbol, you're adding nodes to your selection. And the button to the right is a full clear of your selection. The easiest way to pick nodes uh, is to view the nodes with this button over here, and then nodes become selectable. You can see this node here has turned orange. We'll get more into what we can do with these nodes uh, shortly when we look at the full FE condensation. To the right, we have uh, by default a 2D view. So this is a 2D view of your whole model. This can be very useful when we get on to replacing shafts, you can select your shafts within this model rather than having to look through the list. And it's good as a reference model, uh, reference drawing for your design. We also have a component tree, should you need it, and a tab called FE model details. So this will show uh, information for your model, your condensation nodes and their positions, uh, any selected nodes as we've used with the node selection, this will allow you to change your selected nodes to be free condensation or fixed nodes when you're using full FE. We have some information about elements, contact pairs, multipoint constraints, uh, materials, and element properties. A lot of these tabs are going to be empty for this because it's a single piece model. OK. Finally, down here, we have our settings window. I'm not going to jump 
Uh, I'm not going to go through every tab with this this second because we're going to use those to go through in importing your FE uh, next. So the first thing I'm going to do is talk about externally reduced FE. So what externally reduced FE is, is you can create your model in your FE program, create a mesh and some boundary conditions. You can create uh, condensation nodes within that model, and then you use your FE program to run the condensation to generate a mass and stiffness matrix. We can then import that mass and stiffness matrix into master, uh, tell master the node positions using a node position file, and Possibly, if you, if you require, you can import a 3D uh, visualization on top of that. Using externally reduced FE, the 3D won't be deformable. It will just be a solid uh, within your model. You can change the transparency, of course, so you can see through it, but it's not going to deform with your analysis. When we get onto the full FE in a few minutes, we will see that when that has been included, you do get full deformation within your results. So we're going to jump into this model I've got here that has no FE in it, and we're going to start importing some FE from the top. So the first thing you'll see up here is in the FE components window, we do have a series of buttons as well. The main one, the first one we want is the add imported FE component. So this is the physical component that you will see in your design view uh, that will house all of the different FE component designs within your model. I'm going to be replacing the planet carrier, so I'm going to call this one planet carrier. We can see now we have a component in here. Uh, we've got this little FE element symbol, but it's currently gray, which means that no FE model is active. Next, if we select this, we'll see the other buttons become available. We have the add FE, which allows us to add multiple designs to this component. We also have rename, duplicate, and delete. So we're just going to use the add FE button and I'm going to call this carrier FE externally reduced. So now when we select this and it's not the none component, we're able to access all of our options for importing the FE itself. When you want to change between these, obviously we have checkboxes, but you can also change these uh, design variable FEs on a load case basis. So you could run several load cases varying, for example, uh, planet gear or gear blank design, sorry, and then look at your results and view the view the differences. So we've got this component here, carrier FE externally reduced. We'll see currently there's nothing in the model setup. So this is where these tabs at the bottom here come into play. The first thing we want to look at is the import export tab. This is where we tell master the type of FE we're going to be importing. So we have externally reduced currently, and the other option is a full FE mesh, which we'll get to. So we're going to look at the externally reduced FE. The next button here, which is, is here for both the external reduced and the full FE is the is housing button. What this does is allows master to differentiate whether or not it's a housing or a rotating shaft. And this changes the components that are allowed to be connected to it. So if you were to define that the component was a housing, you would have access to, for example, uh, any grounded components in your model or anything that's connected to any shafts that aren't rotating. In this case, we're going to be looking at the planet carrier. So we're going to leave this is housing unchecked. We can look here, currently nothing's visible, but we can show the model itself. And we're going to be replacing this planet carrier here. So the first thing we want to do is to import the node positions. So this button here allows us to select the import window. When you have generated your externally reduced model, there'll be three things that uh, you'll have to get out of your FE program. These are detailed with uh, instructions as to how to find these in the help file. So as I said, we're not going to go through that here. 
But in this case, we're going to import the node positions file. And this is just a text document that your FE program can uh, generate, which shows XYZ positions of all of your generated nodes. It's important to get your distance units correct when you're importing files. So here, meters, millimeters, etc. Uh, I'm not 100% sure what this model's in, but I'm going to assume meters. Yeah, there we go. We can see that it's correct because obviously if you've chosen millimeters, it would be a factor of 1,000 out. So just something to be aware of when you're importing your, your uh, node positions or anything into the FE section of master. Another thing we can do is, as I said, we can add a 3D geometry. So in this place, I'm going to select add, and we have here this planet carrier already defined. We can import WRL and STL files for this. So now we see this is a, a better representation of our planet carrier. It kind of helps us to see what's going on. Unless you're really familiar with your model, it can sometimes be difficult just defining uh, what you're actually working with when it's just a, a, a cloud of nodes. Okay, so next we're going to move on to the Replace Shafts tab. So in this case, we're going to tell Master that we're replacing the Planet Carrier Shaft, which in uh, this model is represented by this shaft here. So you can see here, we have the full list of shafts that we could replace in the Master model, but once we have selected our shaft in the 2D view, we do get the current selection box up here at the top. It just makes life a bit easier. You don't have to scroll through the list of every shaft available. So I'm just going to use this button here to select Replace Shaft. What this does is tells Master which components we're able to connect to this uh, imported FE. So if I were to turn off the transparent model now and select Connectable Components, we now only have visible the components that are connected to this shaft in, mas in the master model. Currently, uh, the alignment isn't correct, but we will counteract that in a second. You can replace more than one shaft. So, for example, if you were to replace this blank with an FE component, which is two separate shafts, you can just tell master that it's replacing both of these shafts. So any components that are in between these two shafts, for example, our shaft hub connection we would have here, are ignored when you're connecting components because they become irrelevant. So next we're going to move on to the alignment tab. So we have uh, a few options under alignment here. We have automatic, uh, which just aligns the center. So as you connect your uh, components to your nodes, must all align the center of the component to the center of the node as best as it can. This is typically a good way of aligning your model uh, if you have already created your condensation nodes in your FE program. We also have a manual alignment system. So if you did happen to know the X, Y, and Z translation and rotation coordinates, you could uh, apply it this way. We have the datum option, which allows you to align your FE components to any given datum in the model. We also have replaced shaft and shaft. So these do the same thing, but you can, what this will allow you to do is align your FE to a shaft that you've replaced. So in this case, uh, it might be useful to use this selection here. And this will align the center of the FE to the center of this shaft that you've replaced. We also have connectable component and component, which do the same as the replace shaft, except you can choose any component within your model rather than just a shaft. So we can see here now we've chosen the replace shaft to align. It's still in the wrong orientation. So we can use these extra options that appear to the right to help with that. So we already have our component that we're aligning to here, the carrier shaft, but this allows us to choose which axes we're aligning with each other. In this case, it's set to the z-axis being parallel. So this will take the z-axis of your FE component and align it with the z-axis in master. This is clearly not the case. So I believe if we choose one of these other options, this here has aligned the x-axis of your FE with the z-axis in master. 
So because the z-axis of the global coordinate system in master is always uh, along the shafts of your model, this is the axis that we are aligning to with our FE components. If this isn't central, so for example, if your FE component is slightly wider than your shaft in one direction or the other, you can use this axial offset here. So the center will take the center of your, I believe your FE uh, origin and put it central with the shaft. We also have a left and a right and specified. So if you knew the offset or if you need to tweak that offset, you can select specified and change this numerically. In this case, I think it's correct as it is, so we're just going to leave that. Finally, we have the rotation angle. So if you're familiar with master, you'll know that this blue component is a uh, planet carrier and that the light blue lines with them represent where the planetary pins are located. And we can see here that in this FE mesh that we brought in, uh, the nodes for this are not in the correct position. You can use the rotation angle to find this, uh, to change this value. Unfortunately, there isn't an automatic uh, selection unless you're using the auto alignment method. So you have to be able to find this rotation angle either from looking at your 3D in your FE program or from drawings, etc. Believe that this is 20 degrees. Down the bottom here, we also have a few options. We have the tolerances. So master expects a condensation node to be at the center of each component unless specified otherwise. What these tolerances do is just give the allowable tolerance for uh, misalignment of this. So radially 2.5 millimeters by default, axially 1.5 and angular one degree. If these aren't in the correct place, the options are that you can uh, for externally reduced, you could go back to your FE package, change where the condensation nodes are, or you can change the location of the components in master or the alignment of the FE. If it's slightly out of place and you know that that's acceptable, you can just change this tolerance. We also have some information down here which shows the uh, positional errors when you have connected all your components. So currently they don't have any values because we haven't connected the components up yet, but when they have, this would show any X, Y, Z and rotational position errors. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is we're gonna jump into the connections tab. This is where we take the condensation nodes that were generated in our external FE package and we connect them to the components. So typically the way to do this is you can select your nodes in master uh, the condensation nodes, you'll see by default when they're unconnected, they are red. When you select them, they are yellow. And then once you've connected them to a component, they will go green. So this gives you a good indication of whether or not all your nodes are connected. But you can select a node, you'll see it's gone yellow there. And then you can select a component. You don't have to hold down any control keys. You can just click on a component. Without holding control, you can only have one component and one node selected at a time. But I believe if you were to hold control, you can select multiple modes. Let's change this back to the correct node. So now we have the node and the relevant component selected. You'll see the uh, this opt box here has appeared, the links for selected component. We do have a list with all of the component links in, but again, just to make things a bit easier, once you've selected a component, it is highlighted at the top for you. Then we have the options to either delete all the nodes that have been connected before, and we can see here from the external node ID section that there aren't any, or we can add selected nodes to this uh, connection. So I'm just gonna click create link here. We see now we have external node ID one connected to this component. And when I click off, the uh, node has gone green. So we just do this, uh, go through for each of the components. Once you have a few components uh, in place and your FE is in the right place, we do have this option here to auto connect external nodes. So what master will do here is it will uh, search at the center point of each of our components for these nodes. And when we click connect, it will attempt to connect these to the components. You can see there when I click the connect button, 
these two components here went green, or these two uh, condensation nodes, sorry. And again, because I connect or clicked auto connect, when we hide the planet carrier components, all of the nodes for the planet pins have also gone green. The final tab here, which is worth talking about, is the appearance tab. Here we can just change the size of the nodes, the condensation nodes, and any non-condensation nodes that are viewable. So if, if you found the condensation nodes too small, you can make them larger, which does make them easier to select. Maybe that was a little large. And finally, uh, you can change, uh, particularly the useful thing is you can change the color of your geometry. So if you have multiple and you were trying to distinguish between them, this is very useful. Next, we're going to look at the mass and stiffness tab. So now we've connected up our external FE uh, nodes. Currently, we've only given mass to the positions of the nodes. We haven't told it the mass and stiffness between all of those nodes. So this is where this tab comes into play. The easiest way to import these is to use this import button at the top here. When we select this, again, we get the same pop-up window and we should find our mass and stiffness matrix output file that is generated by our FE program. Once we open this, again, we're asked about units. This is very important again. And once we click OK, master will read those output files, whether they're from uh, ANSYS, Abacus, or Nastran, either way. And it will populate this mass and stiffness tables at the bottom here. The alternative is you can paste directly into these tables if you have this data in the correct format. But we tend to find that this button is uh, far more useful. So there are a couple of settings in here that we can also look at. We have the check to see if your FE is grounded. This is just a, uh, a check and if your model is supposed to be grounded, say it's a housing and there is a problem and the uh, master can detect if it's uh, not working correctly and give you an error. So you can turn that off and override it if there does happen to be something you're doing that requires that. The tolerance for zero frequencies uh, will be more apparent when we look in the modal analysis tab for our checking of our imported model. But basically, uh, when you import a model, you're expecting to see six rigid body modes in your free-free analysis. This just changes the tolerance for the, those free-free modes, or those rigid body modes, sorry. Sometimes it may be that they're, we're, by default, the range is at 10 hertz. Sometimes it may be that they're very slightly over, maybe 11 hertz. If you deem that as acceptable, you can again just change the tolerance. These uh, settings down here are for the thermal expansion option that we have in master. So, what this will allow you to do is with uh, an imported FE component, uh, sorry, for an externally reduced component here, we have three options for our uh, thermal expansion if you wish to include it. So you get this uniform option if your component isn't grounded, so if it's not a housing, for example. This will assume uh, the component is, for example, on a table and uniform expansion just around that. And this uses the properties from this material to calculate that. For the other two options, for specified force and specified displacement, if these are selected, your thermal expansion properties can be input in this tab. So for each connection, you get an x, y, and z, and theta x, theta y, theta z value, which you will have to uh, determine from your FE package. And this can be input into this table. And then the expansion effects from these values will, will be taken into account assuming that the option is selected in your load case. Finally, we have these acceleration forces. This just allows you to uh, calculate the acceleration force for gravity from the mass matrix. And the final option is, uh, these are both default checked, and this option assumes that the acceleration forces are only from gravity that are being applied to this model. If you were to uncheck this, uh, that would uh, assume that you can input other acceleration forces from your FE model if that were something you were wishing to include. We also have some small information at the top here. 
For example, the number of condensation nodes and internal modes that were generated from your FE uh, export. And finally, the export for a substructuring command, if you so wish. I'll have a quick look at the static analysis and modal analysis tabs. We can see them here, but because we don't have uh, a full FE mesh, we won't see the full deflection of the component. But what this, allows to, this tab allows you to do in the static analysis is check that your model has been imported correctly. So first option we have here is uh, these are all relative to a displacement check. So on the right, this shows every node in the model and you can ground or apply a force or displacement or torque to any of these nodes. If you were to select a node, again, it's highlighted over here just for ease. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to ground one of these nodes, for example, and apply a displacement to another. Uh, let's give it a Z force, 50 kilonewtons. So when I press solve here, what master will do is apply 50 kilonewtons in Z to this node, and it will ground this node. And you can see here the response from the model. I believe this Z is in relation to the FE uh, coordinate system, not the global coordinate system. So you'll see here that's actually negative Z. But what we get here is you can check your output from each of these nodes if it's what you're expecting to see, for example, and you can see that your model's behaving correctly. If you, for example, had a model with more than one component and you had connected it together and the connections weren't correct, for example, you would see one component moving and one not. That's a good indicator before you get to failing your analysis that something isn't correct. You can also animate this if you, if you wish. We also have this torque transfer check. So this is in a similar manner, but what master will do is pick two nodes and a ground one and apply a torque to the other and we'll check the expected torque response. So in this case, the transfer check has been performed with no problems, but if there was an error, it would tell you which node, uh, which node has been checked and the expected and actual torque received at that node. Just kind of, again, gives you a vague idea if something's not correct. The modal analysis tab is very similar. So these are the uh, frequencies that have been created from your reduced model. In this case, because it's externally reduced, this is all you'll be able to see. We'll come back to this tab when we have full FE and it's slightly more detailed for your checking of your results. And also we'll go into this batch operations tab with the full FE. Uh, it makes more sense to explain that. So that's a, a good overview of the externally reduced FE. We're going to jump in now and we're going to add a new imported FE component. We go back to the model setup tab. And we're going to include the imported FE housing. Oh, I'm just going to call this housing. Again, we go through the same process, add a new component, full FE housing. And we can start going through this import process again. So first, we're going to choose full FE mesh which gives us a few more options uh, around here. And you'll see these mesh options have appeared now, which weren't there before that we spoke about at the start of this uh, webinar. So first thing we're going to do, if we show the model, is we're going to uh, choose the file that contains the FE mesh on import. So there's a couple of options here with uh, regards to your importing. As with the externally reduced FE, you can uh, create your condensation nodes in your FE package, or we have the ability to create condensation nodes within master. What I'm going to show you here initially is how we do it within master, and then I can bring in uh, after that a, uh, a model that's the same. We won't go through the whole process, but it just shows uh, how the process is slightly different. So the first thing we're going to do here is look at the import external FE mesh button. So we click import here 
and I'll locate it again, casing, full FE mesh only. Uh, so currently there's nothing here, but that's because the dropdown set to Abacus input files. Uh, we work here in ANSYS, so if we were to select that, we have the options. But we can import Abacus input files, ANSYS input files, uh, Nastran BDF files, and Abacus output files. So I'm going to choose here the casing mesh only with the annulus included. Again, we get asked which units uh, this is in. I'm going to assume that it's newtons and meters again, but I guess we'll see. So there we go. It's in the uh, correct units. So our FE is now being brought into the model. And again, we can go through the same process to connect it all up. We still have the option for replace shafts. And in this case, we're going to use the replace shafts option because we are assuming that the annulus in this model is pressed into the housing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell master that we're replacing this shaft that the annulus is on. And that will allow master to connect the annulus gear directly to the housing. Uh, just a quick note of something I missed in the import export tab. There are a few other buttons down here So you can open an existing SMT FE file. So this is a file that we Generate where we generate the condensation and store it externally and again, these are the options we have here. So by default when you've generated your uh, Condensation model it's stored within the master file, but these models can get quite large. So we do allow you to store them externally in what we call SMT FE files. And you don't have to load those at the start of opening your model. When you go to press open, there's a checkbox uh, and you can uncheck that if you don't want to load your FE components. So this can save a lot of time if you just want to do some basic analysis and don't need the entire FE loaded. So we've replaced our shaft here. Uh, next is the alignment tab. This model seems to be already aligned, but again, it's the same process as we saw before, uh, the same options. So you just align this to be in the correct orientation for your model. Because we haven't created any FE nodes already, the auto mode wouldn't work here because we have nothing to connect uh, the components to. So you would have to know either the date and position of your FE relative to your design, or the displacement, or you can use replaced shafts, for example. This is all something you'd uh, consider when you're generating your FE file beforehand. Okay, so now we're in position, we're gonna go to the connections tab. So it's slightly different here uh, with full FE. Almost everything's the same, except we have this link node source option here. Uh, I. I <laughs> I also forgot to tell master that it's a housing. So what you were seeing there is we've only got these two components available to be connected because I'd forgotten to tell master that it's a housing. So you'll see when I select is housing, all of these uh, grounded components, so in this case the bearings, become available to connect into your model. So now when we jump back to the connections tab, they're all available for us to define how we want to create these connections. So in this case, if I show connectable components, we're going to be generating a condensation node for each of our bearings here and for this, uh, for the planet, oh sorry, for the annulus gear in the planetary system. So what we have to do is we go through each of these options that we wish to connect. So we've got here the annulus connected and change from existing condensation node to another one of these options. So the options we have are create a single axial node. So this will make a node in the center, uh, in the center of the component, uh, connecting to every node around the outside uh, within the defined boundary area. We can create nodes at angles. So if we were looking at a uh, gear train like we have in this model, we could create a node at just the contact angle if that's all we were interested in. Uh, saves on computation time. 
And also we can create a flexible node ring, which for this annulus is probably a good option. So if we select flexible node ring, this tells master to create nodes at patches all the way around the ring of the annulus. It's very good for capturing a uh, deflection of your gear in a kind of out of round way, um, but does create a node at a lot of patches around this model. So in this case, the default is 35. All of these selection areas are uh, modifiable. So if I were to turn this off here, we can see currently these are the patches that are defined. You can change these patches using the number of axial, or sorry, the number of nodes in the ring. So you could change that up or down. And also uh, we can now add multiple nodes axially. So if you were to look at coning on your gear, for example, you'd have multiple axial nodes and it would show any coning uh, in your model. In this case, one seems okay. We also have this coupling type. So master now does a fairly good job of deciding which coupling type we want to use, but you can override that. And we have two options. So we have kinematic and distributing. Uh, kinematic is effectively a rigid bond between uh, the component and the node. And distributing is more of a flexible bond that allows the average displacement from the nodes uh, across the surface. I say uh, master does a very good job now of predicting it, but if that's not what you're looking for, you can change that. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through now and just quickly select all of these components. Uh, in this case, for these bearings, for example, they're quite small, probably don't need a flexible node ring. So we're just going to go with a single axial node. this bearing over here. And finally, we've got this bearing here, which is displaying without a race. So this is because we've told uh, master that the race uh, is included in the FE rather than in the bearing component. And we can see, if we turn the opacity up, the race is in there as a component. So what we do in this situation is we can select the component and we will create a flexible node ring and then master will create a patch uh, for each of the elements. So all of these elements here have been fairly well defined, but if, for example, your housing bore on a bearing was slightly larger than your bearing uh, and you were using this to mock up a design, you can change the search regions uh, in the FE program, or oh, sorry, in master to encompass those. So we then look in the search regions tab and we can define uh, the region that we're searching in using these values. So if I were to select this, for example, I think I've turned search regions off. So by default, it's unselected. And then we have this yellow band up here. So you could change the diameter or the thickness, for example, just to tweak where you're looking for nodes on the surface of your FE model. In this case, they're all fairly standard, uh, fairly okay. Even the, the nodes for the race have picked up quite well. So we'll just leave those as they are. Uh, this is also good for defining the properties of the flexible node rings. You can change uh, the span of the patches, for example, the angle of the center of the connection of the patch, uh, all of these features just to get the connection exactly as you're expecting it to be. Uh, I have had a question here just quickly uh, to say, is it enough to have a single condensation over the tooth width? So again, this kind of comes back to what we've discussed with uh, axial or number of axial nodes. So it depends on your analysis, really. If you're not interested in gear coning, uh, that typically is, is not a problem. But if you're looking at coning, you would want more axially across the, the width of the gear to look into that effect. Okay, so again, the appearance is fairly similar. You can change the color, etc., etc. But for setup of, of full FE, 
this is mostly it. So we would just now move on to the mass and stiffness tab. It's slightly different to uh, the externally reduced FE. So we have no table that we can paste mass and stiffness into because it will all be generated in master. So we can see here, we have a couple of other options. Uh, these are all the same. The only difference we have here is for thermal expansion, we have this calculated using material properties. So when you're uh, bringing your FE into master, you would have the material properties defined in your FE program, and master can use those and the temperatures defined in design mode to calculate thermal expansion if that option is turned on. Calculate reduced gravity load. Uh, again, this is very similar to before. This just allows uh, the effects of gravity to be calculated on the model. Use Jacobian checking. So this comes into play, as I mentioned before, when you have uh, a warning about your Jacobian elements. Um, I don't seem to have any on either of these two. But if this option is turned on, master will not let you uh, run a condensation if you have negative Jacobians. It's just kind of a, a double check uh, that you're happy with that to run. And if you did have negative Jacobian elements, you can just check that off and then master will allow you to run the condensation. Internal vibration mode options. Uh, this allows you to run, to generate internal vibration modes for use in the NVH mode. So the default is no modes, but you can select to, gen to calculate all modes within a certain range. Uh, the lowest number of nodes, so in this case 40, within a range, and the nearest to shift. So the nearest to shift is where you define a given frequency and master defines the closest 40 modes to that frequency. Uh, we have a couple of solver options here for this as well. We do have an out of core solver. Uh, so using your disk memory rather than RAM uh, and a few options for this. Again, we have some information at the top here. So the number of elements, uh, nodes, condensation nodes and internal modes that are generated. An estimation for memory usage. Uh, just another option, another place where you can store your FE externally if you wish. And finally, some options to export information, uh, including condensation node locations generated in master back to your FE program if you wish to use that. Okay, so uh, I don't think this would take very long to condense, but because we're getting close to the end time, I'm going to open the model that already has the FE generated. And I'm gonna look at the full mesh casing with accelerometer nodes here. So you can see here the stiffness and mass matrices have now been uh, fully populated. Again, we can use the static analysis tab. Uh, we can use this to check our model exactly as before, except here you would see a 3D deformation. But the modal analysis tab is really uh, more telling. So you can see here how the 3D has been affected. We have the reduced model frequency but we can also calculate uh, the full FE modes. This should only take a couple of seconds. But this uh, performs a free-free modal analysis on the geometry of your design and shows the calculated modes versus the, uh, sorry, the calculated mode frequencies versus the reduced model mode frequencies. So it's quite, it's quite useful for uh, checking so we've got a percentage error here, checking how close you are within uh, your tolerance. Finally, we have the batch operations tab. So this is uh, fairly new. And what this will allow you to do is queue up a series of condensations, check which ones you want to run, and then press run. And you could leave it uh, for a day or overnight, and it would run through those condensations one after the other. Okay, so... We've got some FE already generated in this model. Uh, just a quick point to show is you can add in other nodes that aren't connected. So in this case, we've added in, this will have been done in our FE program, but you can use the node selection to do this. You can generate a node and if you don't connect it to a component, what this will allow you to do is just measure responses at this point. 
So every node in your FE is uh, selectable when we go to look at the, for example, MVH mode. We could then just use results from this point, uh, for example, acceleration results to look at uh, results on the surface of your housing. So we've got some FE generated here. Uh, we've seen how we uh, set it all up in master. If we quickly have a look through into system deflection, we can look at how some of these results uh, are kind of used in your analysis. So just a typical system deflection here. If I were to run this load case, so what is happening is you'll have the same analysis as previously, but what master will do is instead of assuming that your uh, component is grounded, for example, where your bearings are, it will take the stiffness between all of those node points we defined and the grounding point on the casing and use that as your overall stiffness. So I turn on solid housings here. We can see if we put on a displacement contour, we can see the displacement across the entire mesh and we can change the scale of that. So we'll see a 3D representation of that displacement. The other thing we can do is we can do some stress calculation on the surface. Now, obviously this is only uh, as accurate as the FE mesh that you've created and a finer FE mesh will take more time to reduce. But if we were to select this FE results tab, we can calculate the stresses for the casing and press OK. And then we can view that in our 3D view here. Uh, the other place where the FE is most useful is in modal analysis and MVH mode. So if we were to look at the 3D view for this, for example, uh, and run, run a basic gear wine, basic LTCA, what we should be able to do is take a look at some of these uh, modal responses. So this is a, a good place to look to begin with. Again, same process, turn on solid housings, and then you can look at your contours. Uh, let's have a look at linear magnitude. If we were to choose a mode, when that updates, oh, maybe that's not a good mode. There we go. So we can see uh, here the range of magnitude, or you can also see kinetic and strain energy within your 3D model. Uh, a lot of this MVH stuff was covered in a previous webinar, so that is available on the SMT website, or if it's not, it will be very soon. So yeah, you can see, again, displacements in here. And in our dynamic response tab, for example, looking at the FE component, what we can do is use either the waterfall chart or an order cut, you could look at acceleration, and then you'll see that the nodes are selectable in this view up here. So these three nodes here, the external nodes, are external ID nodes, uh, they can be named, but these are the accelerometers that we have created. So if I were to pick one of these, this is the response that we'll see at that point on the housing. Just quickly, uh, with relevance to the naming of these nodes, if we go back to the FE tab, something I did forget. In the FE model details, if we look in condensation nodes, you can use a custom name for any of these uh, nodes available here. So if we had defined names for accelerometers, I could check this and call it accelerometer one, for example. Okay, so that's uh, a kind of brief overview of the FE, working with FE in master, uh, importing it into master, running a condensation, and then some of the effects it can have on your responses. Uh, we have one other quick question here. How much did the acceptable percentage error in your, uh, in your modal analysis? Uh, I don't think we have kind of a, a given percentage. Uh, it's just, I tend to use it as if one percentage is much higher than the other, for example, uh, that will be a problem area. Obviously, if you're getting to high numbers, then it's, it's probably not a, a good representation. 
but it would be however uh, you feel is is representative between your FE model, the fully calculated, and the reduced model. Okay, so we do have a couple of minutes, so if you do have any questions, uh, I can answer them. Um, if not, and if you think of anything later, you can just email support at uh, smartnt.com and we will get back to you as quickly as possible. Otherwise, uh, it's just good to note that the registration will open for next month's webinar soon, and that should be on modeling of complex planetary arrangements in master. Before we go as well, regarding to FE, uh, something to note. So an upcoming feature, we are looking at internally meshing uh, shafts within master. So basic shafts, you would be able to mesh directly in master, you wouldn't have to use an FE package, but this should be available from master nine onwards. So something to look forward to. Okay, so one quick one there is, uh, how much is the allowed alignment error? Again, this is, is very situational. Um, ideally, you'd look for none, but it, it, it very much depends on your design. Uh, if you're in a very concept stage, it probably doesn't matter too much at all. You might be able to use it to just tweak an existing casing to fit something else. Um, but it, it's <laughs> kind of difficult to define. It, yeah, I'd say ideally would be none, but I've, I've used kind of dependent on situation, maybe four or five millimeters, dependent on if it's uh, in an important area or not. You kind of have to gauge whether or not you would want to go back to uh, your 3D and whether it's worth remodeling. The results might change slightly with a large alignment error. Um, again, it very much depends on the geometry, uh, position, location, for, exa for example. Okay, so oh, one more question quickly. What's the difference between the internal vibration mode options? So if I jump back here quickly. So we said here, uh, so there, there, are, there are four options. So calculating no modes at all. It's, it's just defining where, which modes you're resolving for. Um, all in range gives you literally every mode within that range. So if there were a thousand modes between zero and a hundred kilohertz, it would generate all of them. Uh, lowest gives you the first 40 or the first defined number within that range. And nearest to shift gives you the defined number closest to a given frequency. I wouldn't say one is more robust than the other. Uh, it's purely based around what you're interested in looking at specifically with MBH and how much computational power you have available. Obviously, if you're calculating for more internal modes, you're gonna need more memory uh, to calculate that. Okay, so I say, if you do have any more questions, uh, we will answer them uh, over support. Someone will send an email out to you. We have your, your names and email addresses. Thank you very much for, for joining.